Not enough. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good, and we've got two chats here now starting to show up. All right. No chats yet. Public chat. I see um, there's three comments there. You see them. Oh, yeah, there we go. Emmanuel. There's nine, nine, nine people, I think. Yeah, Mark Oxborough. Good. We got nine viewers. Welcome, everyone. We will be starting at um, 2.04 precisely. So we have another three minutes before we begin. And um, so we will, we will start in just a second. Usually we start John at 204 so that people, usually we don't get the full crowd until here they come. Um, the crowd tends to join by 204, 205, but we'll start at 204. <clears throat> So I see there are slides up there now. Yeah. Which I don't know if they're mine, you know, in the sense that because I stopped sharing my screen. Uh, um, I see the slides. Um, if I just go to smart, I mean, so, yeah, I, and that's a full screen for them. If you, right, so if I can move those along myself. Yeah, then, yeah, I think you can. Go ahead, do do that really quickly. Well, it, there's no obvious way to do it. It's, so you use your cursor. Oh, you just click. Yeah, I think so. See, I just switched mm. that. No, it's, it's not. That's not working for me. Oh, there, well, okay, you did that, did you? I did that. So yeah, what I, you I can do, John, um, is tell me to switch it then, because I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, David says use left and right arrows, but that's not working for you. Well, there are no left and right arrows that I can see. I suspect you. No, 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 no. I mean on your someone... keyboard, on your keyboard, John. Oh, yeah, I just did that and it disappeared. There it goes. Oh, there we go. Yeah, there you go. Just use your keyboard. Wow. Okay. Marvelous. Okay. Yeah. I think we're all set. We're, we're supposed to have 21, 21 people have signed up. So let's just give it another minute or so and we'll be good. <laughs> this is always a journey. <laughs> mm. uh -huh. Traveled all over the world, but sometimes I can't navigate the internet. <laughs> wow, I think we all have that problem. <laughs> yeah, here they come. We'll give it a little bit more time. We're up to eleven now, so we got a little bit more time. Nope. Someone's suggesting it's better to show my face next to the slides. So I don't know. Okay, so oh, yeah. if you do that, just above, mm -hmm. it, there's a camera and a, a yeah. frame. So that should. Okay, be there. I see. Do you see your picture in the in the slide? Then? Yeah, I guess everyone has the opportunity to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And I'll let you control it from your end. Yeah, sure. Okay, John. Well, let's go ahead and start because the time has come. Um, welcome to the Montague Barker Lecture Series for all that have joined. I know more that will be joining as we go forward, but we want to welcome John Heathershaw, who has an excellent talk on why do central Asians hate politics, understanding political and social change um, in, the, in the former uh, Soviet South. And uh, John is professor at the University of Exeter. He studies uh, uh, international politics of the international politics of conflict, security, and development, with special focus on post-Soviet Central Asia. Although his PhD is in um, IR, I'll let you explain that. <laughs> he considers himself an interdisciplinary scholar. He regularly works with scholars of anthropology, geography, history, and theology and religion. He combines analysis of the symbolic with that of the economic. And with that, I turn it over to you, John. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, 
I think we've got one comment still saying that, Tom, you need to click on my photo. Okay, so just a second. I will do that. All right. I'll just get over there. So I click on your photo. Okay. I yeah. think that's so that people can see For me. You. There's an X here. I don't know why I click the X. Okay. I click the photo. Microphone. Maybe if, if people in the audience can see me, maybe they can say so in the chat. Okay. Um, no, we can't, says David. So, okay, you're being... so, so there's a. I'm clicking on the photo. Um, okay, I'm clicking on your photo, and then there's a click up here. Just a second. Okay. Wait a minute. No, now it's just me. Uh, uh, John has to get back on. <sighs> we are a little bit um, mixed. Um, I, I tried to get John's picture up, and I'm afraid that I accidentally. There you go, John. You're just going to need to go. All right. I clicked on your picture and your microphone's on. So, um, uh, it looks like I'm muted. Oh, no, no, you're not muted. You're fine. Okay. All right. Just go ahead. I, I don't. Right. Know. Well, I'm just going to trust that people can see me and hear me. Yes. It's all right. Can people see me and hear me? Because I. Good. I, yes. We can see you. We can hear you. Okay, good. Oh, All right, go ahead, John. Oh, boy. It says John became Tom again here, but um, <laughs> I, if, I, if I was in the audience, I'd be very frustrated. Oh, there you if, go. Uh, You're on uh, now, John. You are, you are on. Great. There we are. Fantastic. Okay, so, um, yeah, my name is is John Heavishaw, and I am a professor of international relations at the University of Exeter. Um, I don't necessarily assume that everyone knows what that means. International relations in the US is generally studied uh, as part of political science. So that part of political science, which is looking at the external relations of states and governments. In the UK, it's got slightly different origins in sort of related to the study of law, political theory, international history. Uh, but I think both those sets of origins are, are perhaps a little uh, deceptive today because we really today think about international relations as all forms of politics inside and outside the state and how the external life of countries are connected to the internal lives of countries in very complex and deep ways and um, that's kind of the story i'm going to to tell you today about about central asia I'm just checking that. OK, maybe. So for me, um, I need to click on the picture so I can see the text uh, because it's too small on my screen if I just have this format. So I think you can see me again now, but I've got I probably can manage with that. I'll just have to really squint at the screen. OK, um, but we'll um, we'll see how it gets. it gets for us. So. <clears throat> Yeah, so I put two maps up there, and um, the yellow one is the one I suppose that I'm kind of thinking about today. So the yellow one includes eight former Soviet republics. That's five Central Asian republics and three of the Caucasus. It's a very complex geography, actually, and there's autonomous republics and autonomous regions that originate from the former Soviet Union as well such as Karabakh, which is obviously the uh, focus of a, of a terrible renewed armed conflict at present. Uh, I highlight those two maps, though, including the one uh, to the left with from a book called The History of Inner, Inner Asia by Svat Suchek about 20 years ago, which has quite a different 
understanding of inner or, or Central Asia to include parts of uh, Western China, particularly Xinjiang and Tibet, mm. uh, Mongolia, and also Afghanistan. Uh, so what precisely we mean by Central Asia is, is contentious. And in, in, in area studies, we spend a lot of time debating you know, what is part of our region, I suppose, and what isn't. And um, we tend to have specific specialisms uh, within our region, in a sense, geographically, of course. So for me, my first foreign language, really, of research is Russian. I, I speak a little Tajik and Kyrgyz as well, but I'm very much focused on the five former Soviet republics. So I'll say a little more about what I do before I get onto the topic of the lecture. Um, so I think this captures the nature of my, my research, really, over the last 20 years. Um, I, I came out of a background in um, government service. I was a civil servant. I was also an aid worker overseas. Part of that was faith-based faith service in Central Asia um, and also in West Africa. And as I went to Central Asia, I was fascinated by the articulations of authority in peace processes, in villages, in, in every area of our life. And it seemed to me this was connected to the Soviet Union, but not fully and completely explained by it. So a large part of my research has been thinking about authoritarianism in different ways and researching aspects of authoritarianism, which perhaps are poorly understood. So there's three contributions of the last five years there that I've highlighted. The book, Dictators Without Borders, with my colleague Alexander Cooley at Columbia University in New York is really trying to tell a different story about Central Asia, which um, is globally connects it really to the rest of the world and, and how the governments of the region, most of which are fully fledged dictatorships, are actually able to operate beyond borders, not simply in traditional diplomacy, but in doing things like setting up bank accounts and making petitions to courts and getting foreign countries that are ostensibly more powerful than them do their bidding in tracking down their exiles overseas. So that's what we, we were looking at there. Uh, with colleagues from Central Asia and part of a large research project I ran, we were looking particularly at this form of authoritarianism in how armed conflicts were managed. So in Central Asia, in some contrast to the Caucasus, there's been relatively little armed conflict. Um, there's been a civil war in Tajikistan in the 1990s, but since then, armed conflict has been relatively limited um, to small minor armed conflict outbreaks with casualties in the dozens rather than the hundreds or thousands. And um, we were interested in how not just the states, but also some of the civil society actors sought to resolve and manage conflict and, and they did so in a quite authoritarian manner in terms of having dominance of space of the economy and of public discourse and, and that's what that piece there is about and a third thing that i do again with a mix of colleagues is something called the central asian political exiles database so what we do there is chart how uh, fairly leading political figures have gone into exile as they've been pushed out of their country and then how they're tracked down and subject to what's called transnational repression mm. by their home governments. So I hope that gives you a sense, I'm happy to talk more about any of those, but I hope that gives you a sense of, of what I do is is a bit on the dark side of politics really. Um, I think that's probably driven by my own sort of sense of that politics should have a moral purpose the study of politics that is but also the practice and um, there are some deep problems with the kind of politics we get in in central asia but those problems aren't just local problems they're international and global problems mm. which we are fully implicated in as as foreigners as foreign states as foreign citizens and consumers okay Oh, here we go. So just an example of this. This is taken from the Dictators Without Borders book. Very complicated chart. So I showed you a couple of maps of Central Asia at the beginning. Um, that's a traditional cartography. You know, these are countries with borders, maybe some mountains or whatever. 
um, here's a different spatial imagining of Central Asia. There's a different geography of Central Asia. So one of the big stories of uh, Tajikistan, which is a country I spent a fair amount of time li living in, I wrote a book purely about Tajikistan, has been how it recovered from the armed conflict in a way that made its authoritarian government more dictatorial and gave them a greater domination of the economy. What they essentially did was kind of co-opt rival warlords into a single regime. And as they did that, some of those warlords didn't survive for very long. Others made pacts with the devil, so to speak, and uh, came, became fully incorporated within that regime. But And so one of the stories of that was the capture of the major industrial asset in the country, which around this time was earning about 40% of all foreign currency income for the country, which was the, the aluminium smelter in a town outside of the capital of Dushanbe and the Tajik Aluminium Company that ran that. Now that was previously held by rival factions in the civil war, um, but through making various alliances with warlords, uh, the new government, which was really just an evolution of the old government coming out of the civil war, managed to uh, form alliances that allowed it to capture territorial control of the aluminium cell smelter and nominal control of the company, which was this hugely important economic asset. But in practice, to have control of a, a major extractive industry like that today, you don't just need physical control of the asset. What you need is financial and legal control. And that was a story which brought in actually a whole variety of places, uh, many of which aren't that map aren't on the map there. But but three of the most important ones were probably Norway, the British Virgin Islands, and the United States of America. So first of all, why Norway? Well, the major partner of the aluminium company was Norsk Hydro, which is a half Norwegian state-owned um, extractive industries com com company, particularly aluminium company um, and in order for it to do business with Tajikistan it had to sign off with due diligence on the fact that it could do business without the proceeds being captured by the elites that ran the state without grand corruption or what we call kleptocracy actually that's anyone who really knows about Tajikistan can tell you that's exactly what's going to happen and it would have been clear in 2000 and and uh, seven when that deal was struck um and it was it's very clear now because we have all the evidence um but for some reason the norwegians despite having a very strong set of ethical corporate social responsibility call it what you will they got people who would sign off on that and so that was that was part of the deal which established that key relationship perhaps more importantly than that was offshore bank accounts secret and hidden in the British Virgin Islands, where something called transfer pricing would occur, which is, although all the work is being done in Tajikistan, legally, the profits are accrued in the British Virgin Islands. So all the money is being earned in the BVI, and it's being kind of held there. Now, what the Tajik government said is, that's fine, because we've taken over that company, uh, and we, that offshore company, and that's now a state company. But actually, when we look at the money going through there, and it was best estimates, something like one billion dollars and or about 15 percent of the GDP of the country um, in this specific period of time, then we see that it's going to all sorts of things. Some of it is going to pay for a um, renovation and a modernization of the aluminium smelter. But a lot of it is going to private interests of the Tajik elites around around the president, President Rahman, and shopping trips for his wife, uh, buying or leasing airplanes for his daughter's airline, and a number of things like that. And a third and final global element is is in the United States, which was okay. You want you want a legal contract and agreement. You need your financial connections. But you also need tacit political support uh, for your projects. And so one of the things that the company, that the offshore company in the BVI was, was, was used for, was to pay for lobbying in Washington, D.C. to successfully get the United States government to support a big new 
uh, project in Tajikistan, which was uh, the Rogan Dam, which is when it's fully completed, well, already is really the, the highest dam. I think it's the highest dam in the world. And that was interesting for us because that was actually contrary to US law, where there is a requirement to report on lobbying. Um, foreign lobbying all needs to be reported to the Department of Justice. Uh, but because they went for an offshore company and hid the foreign state involvement, um, they were able to get away without reporting the lobbying they were doing. And we only found out about it through some pretty intense investigative work working with journalists. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to give you a picture here that this small little unimportant country can be deeply globally connected. And it's connected in ways where it's not immediately clear who really is most powerful when we think about our normal political geography of countries. Now, how did the United States government or the Norwegian government indeed allow themselves to be beholden to this, to accept the corrupt political interests of the Tajik government? Uh, many people might say, well, that's simply a quid pro quo, but it's not clear to me that it was at all, actually. And a lot of it was based on the fact that the kind of legal checks that should have been taking place weren't. So there was a total failure of accountability and regulation according to the laws of the various places in which this was happening. Now, all of this um, is kind of a bit of a preamble. I, I'm, this is another example. I maybe, because I want to, I don't want to spend too much time laboring on these cases, some of which might be unfamiliar to you. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one. This is a case from Kazakhstan of uh, of a man who, as a renegade oligarch, became the number one objective of Kazakh foreign policy, still remains so in many ways. He's still at large now having won, recently won political asylum in France. But another case where being in control of your home country is deeply connected to acting overseas against your opponents in this case and maybe in the previous case to bring in new allies and bring in new connections i i won't i won't um i won't go over that case because i'm aware of time ticking on and what i'm saying now really is is preambular to the question i want to ask today which is why do central asians hate politics now the kind of politics i've described is one that i dislike a great deal and because it's one of complicity. It's one of Westerners very often claiming to be for ethics and for intervention, and giving development aid to Central Asia, being in support of human rights, whilst because of our deeply unregulated system, actually in effect making the problem worse. So it's reasonable to ask this question of why do Central Asian and Central Asians take politics? However, this question is a, a Western question by origin. Uh, the book that you see there, Why We Hate Politics, is a book written, I think it was about 15 years ago, by uh, the well-known British political scientist Colin Hay, called Why We Hate Politics. And it was focused on the West. And um, he was interested in, in how people had become more apathetic about politics, why voting rates had gone down, why people, people said they trust government less than they did put me in the past. And, uh, and so Hay, Hay framed it in these demand side and supply side ways. Really, is it, is it about the public just becoming less, interest because, less interested because of social change? Or is it a supply side issue, which is, is it about the politics we're giving them, the kind of politics I've already talked about, actually? So that's a Western question, but I think it's a reasonable one to ask of Central Asia too because there's lots of evidence that Central Asians hate politics, probably more in fact than we do in the West. At least we have viable democracies just about still uh, with elections that matter. And that's not generally, generally true there with, with one partial exception that I'll come to. So we see evidence of this, I think in several ways, uh, nostalgia for the former Soviet, for the Soviet Union, uh, lots of people with very fond memories back to the time when the Soviet system created order, created opportunity, um, which I think, given what we know about Soviet history, is deeply worrying. A widespread belief in conspiracy theories about 
Russia or the West or some other great power um, meddling in our politics and making things like this or that. Also conspiracy theories about the deep state and how the family in charge controls absolutely everything. And there's some truth to that, unfortunately. Uh, but generally, belief in conspiracy theories suggests a real strong antipathy towards the political realm. Um, retreat from political participation. So, you know, there was a brief moment in most countries where you you had something that might look like a competitive election in the early 90s and some countries going on longer. But there's been a real retreat from that. And that's been a particularly ac acute amongst ethnic minorities who have become marginalized in societies. I think we can also talk about the prevalence of both patriarchy and paternalism in public life. So a public discourse which says politics is something we give to you on our terms. It's not something that you help us create. And that's very pronounced in Central Asia. And then I think finally, um, the fact that large numbers of Central Asian citizens aren't really present to participate. They are migrating out. Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan over most of the, the last decade have been two of the top three most migration dependent countries in the world. They tend to go to Russia, also to Kazakhstan within the region, some also in the Persian Gulf. But that sheer volume of out migration seems to have an effect. So we, we can ask this demand or supply side question about why Central Asians hate politics just as we can about why Westerners do. Um, is it about them or is it about the politics that's offered to them? Now, I think you've got a sense or, or already from me that I think it's more on the supply side, that it's about the politics that's being offered to them. Uh, so the secondary question then for me is, if it is about the politics, is that just about these national regimes and how they run their own countries, regardless of the wider world? Or is it about how these regimes have become globalized, how they're globally connected in ways that perhaps mean they are more attentive to what's happening in the offshore financial services industry or in courts in Norway or London or Sweden than they are in terms of meeting demands of their citizens back home. And that's the kind of argument I'm, I'm leading you towards really. So we need to understand this, we need to put this in the context of political transformation in Central Asia since the end of the Soviet Union in 1991. Uh, and that's what I'm going to try and do by just really breezing through some basic stats and figures and some basic political history of the period. So um, classic work in the 1990s on, on this by Offen Adler called the transition that all former Soviet states faced as being one which was threefold. It was, it was about the regime, it was about the economy, and it was about civil society. So it was for, about going from a single party or authoritarian system that you had in the Soviet Union to multi-party politics. It was about going from the Soviet planned economy to free market capitalism. And it was about going from a social sphere which was completely controlled by the state to one of an independent civil society. Now, in hindsight, of course, um, but I think also to some extent at the time by more attentive scholars, it was recognised that this was a very limited way of thinking about transition. It was a way of thinking about transition as something where the content of politics and economy and society were changing, even though the form of politics was staying the same. But the thing was, that's not really what was happening. The form of politics was also changing. Uh, most obviously, simply in the sense that you had a Soviet Union of 15 republics, which became 15 independent sovereign nation states. Mm. And then within that, you had breakaway regions. I mentioned Karabakh already, but there are many more. If you think of Chechnya or Transnistrian Moldovan Republic, other parts of the Caucasus, there were potentially irredentist disputes elsewhere across Russia, even parts of Central Asia, like Gorno Badakhshan in Tajikistan. So the whole identity of the political units, the form that they took was at stake too. But even prior to that, Perestroika, Glasnost, which were these reform processes that Gorbachev envisaged, 
occurring in the late 80s, which actually led to uh, a great deal of conflict, uh, nationalist mobilizations in particular. So uh, alongside Soviet republics becoming sovereign states, you also had this transition of form from a, a form of armed conflict to a form of order. And, and all Central Asian states at least experienced elite conflict over the over the uh, uh, over what future they would they would face. And then I think we can also speak finally about a move from a Soviet internationalism, which was all about connecting the republics to other parts of the world where there were downtrodden peoples who could be rescued by socialism. That was a particular form of internationalism to nationalism where Stalinist nationalities policy ended up getting turned on its head. Stalinist nationalities po policy was that things would be um, national in form, but socialist in content. Actually, the socialism went out of the window. But as one scholar has said, the national form ended up taking over the content. And so what we had is nationalist regimes in both form and content emerging. So the point here is that the political transformation wasn't simply one of content, it was one of form. It was one of the form and the political units themselves. And, and in many ways, this transformation of form was prior to, and more important and significant than, the transformation of content itself. So I'm, I'm gonna evidence all this, and um, I'm not just gonna show you graphs, but I'm gonna show you some graphs. Uh, and that can be incredibly boring, I think. Uh, so I'm just going to use them as sort of aid memoirs, really, and to pick out some some general trends. So I, I hope it's that that this bit is not too boring. I've got lots of tales to tell as well, and uh, we we can get into those a little bit later. But um, I'm going to proceed through these six areas of transition. Now, the graphs I'm going to show you are some, from something called the Bertelsmann Transformation Index, which is one of these kind of big global projects to assess uh, whether it's state strength or human rights or democracy or in, or in this case state transformation. Uh, I was one of their employed experts for several years and I used to do their report on Tajikistan. So I've got a sense of an insight on their data and that's partly why I'm using it here. I also have a quite a critical perspective on their data which probably won't come through entirely in this conversation, but I'd be happy to talk about later because they are operating according to categories and principles which have, I think, something of a Western bias and, and may not fully work in the Central Asian context. But they are the stated objectives of the political elites in Central Asia themselves. So I think it's kind of legitimate to, to look at transformation in this way. Okay, so that first one was about order and conflict. So one of the most remarkable things about Central Asia is there was there's always been project, projections and predictions of armed conflict. Um, there are various views of Central Asia, I guess, which suggest it is a place which should be prone to that. But actually, by any statistic or measure, Central Asia has very low levels of armed conflict. The one exception to that is Tajikistan's civil war in the 1990s, which killed over 50,000 people and sent a quarter of a million refugees into Afghanistan. Uh, it's very little known about in the West, partly because at the time we were focused more on things like um, the, the former Yugoslav conflicts and Rwanda and, and things like this, perhaps. But it was a devastating civil war for a relatively small country, even on terrorism as a, as a metric. So um the stats we've run on this uh central asia has about one one percent of the world's population and 0.07 percent of the recorded terrorist attacks so this is a place where now order is has become very high and i think that's shown there in the graph that you see this is um a measure of the monopoly of force according to expert opinion and some of the core statistics on armed conflict and, and terrorism and um, everywhere in Central Asia now is above the global average uh, for its monopoly on the use of force. Now, remember, these are post-colonial states in a sort of most recent wave of decolonization. Um, if one looked at Africa, 
um, 20, 30 years after the independence periods there, it wouldn't look like this, I can assure you. And it still doesn't today. So Central Asian states in their independence have established order. Even Tajikistan, you can see a fairly sharp incline there. That's partly due to my assessment because I was the uh, appointed expert for most of most of that period. Uh, but all states actually are above that level of order. So Central Asia as a region is is an above average place in terms of the low levels of armed conflict and a high degree of order. So that when we've seen these minor outbreaks of armed conflict, and I could um, I could I could I could say more about those. What's remarkable is out, for outsiders and say, oh, there's another little outbreak of armed conflict in Central Asia. But when you look in detail, what's remarkable about that is how those minor armed conflicts end up staying minor and being resolved. Um, and that's that's a really interesting phenomenon that, that we've been studying. There's also an extraterritorial aspect to them because this high degree of order has meant that if you are a rebel in Central Asia, you can't really stay there. You have to go overseas. And so the Central Asian Political Exiles Project uh, I, I talked about earlier that we run here at Exeter um, is partly about tra tracking state violence as it's been exported to people in Russia, in Turkey, even Sweden and Austria. Um, because individual leaders have been tracked down to those places. But all of this has the effect of increasing the level of order and this monopoly on the use of force. The slight exception to all of this is possibly Kyrgyzstan, where you've had political violence, quite limited again, but enough to remove governments mm. on three occasions now, most recently two weeks ago. Um, there's a lot more that could be said about how and why that's happened. And once again, the level of disorder has been limited. But nevertheless, it has it, it's 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 uh, it's led to a certain amount of instability. OK, second one is and very much continuing from this is 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 strong states. So, again, um, we live in a era of strong and strengthening states, actually. Uh, there's a lot of talk in the 1990s about state failure. Uh, but but today, the global mean of state strength, the way it's measured, is, is quite high. And once again, all Central Asian states come above the average. Um, but I think what's interesting is, is, is not so much how these states are strong states, but how their form has changed. So they're not strong purely because of their control nationally and territorially, but also because of those international elements that I spoke about earlier when I gave you the Tajikistan example. You could, con you could gain full control over a state industry through your connections to the British Virgin Islands, to Norway, and to the United States. So when we think of Central Asian states, therefore, as sometimes being clients of great powers or minor allies, um, and sometimes people think about these states as being part of something called the new great game, uh, that's a reference to uh, the supposed 19th century struggle between Russia and Britain over Central Asia. It never really was a struggle over Central Asia. We can get into that in the comments if you want. It was more something that people like Disraeli and Kipling wrote about than something that really existed in practice. But nevertheless, uh, we, it, when we think about the new great game in Central Asia, we think about the US or Russia or China having allies. But again, if you look at what's going on when the US sets up air bases in Central Asia, as it did in Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan after 2001, or when Russia maintains its ties in Central Asia, mainly on the level of business and industry, or when China invests through what's called the Belt and Road Initiative. What we see is Central Asian states, or well, the regimes that is, hold a great deal of power because they're gatekeepers and rent seekers to their own territories. And they're really, really good at that. They set the terms on which the US can engage. So if the US wants an air base in Kyrgyzstan, it better make sure it, it, it has subcontracts for fuel supply with key people in the regime of power. So what you end up having is a large amount of US taxpayers' money going to pay for massively rising levels of corruption in Kyrgyzstan. And that's how gatekeeping and, and rent seeking works in this environment. 
Okay, and that's the kind of states we have really, states that, that they, they rely partly on their ability to, to rent seek and gatekeep. That's what a lot of their strength is. Um, thirdly, titular nationalism. So what we've seen in Central Asia um, is this shift, and I, I touched upon it earlier, of the rise of titular nationalities within republics. So when we talk about the Kyrgyz Republic or the Republic of Tajikistan, these ethnonyms relate to the titular nationalities as they were created as republics in the Soviet Union. But these were already places with significant minorities. Actually, Tajikistan didn't even have a Tajik majority in 1991. The Tajik population, according to the Soviet census, was, I think, 49 percent. You had huge populations of Russians and Uzbeks and other minorities, too. But what we've seen since 91 is that the dominance of um, the national groups, uh, the ethnic, ethno-national groups. So to the extent that Russians have left in Tajikistan, Uzbeks have, they, they spoke Tajik anyway, and they kind of look Tajik. So many of them just recategorize themselves as Tajik. That's something people do in Central Asia. But what you have is this dominance of a, um, a, a, a the particular dominant ethnic group. Um, and so this is actually, as a form of order, this has been somewhat violent and structurally violent, but it has uh, led to the prevention of the kind of breakaway regions and irredentist pursuits that we've seen elsewhere, particularly in the Caucasus. Um, there's a strong international aspect this as, uh, this as well, where states in Central Asia agree not to intervene in each other's politics. And what they do then is militarize their borders against each other. Ironically, in the Soviet Union, the borders of the Fergana Valley region in the heart of Central Asia were, were relatively open for the vast majority of the time between the republics because they were, they were part of one country. But from the late 1990s, the Uzbek government in particular started putting landmines on the borders. And what followed from that, of course, was uh, many dead people and uh, hundreds and hundreds of dead sheep. Um, so we've got a situation of militarization at the borders and um, very strong nationalism here. I'm highlighting uh, Nick McGoran's work here um, about how political this whole process was. There's a quote there from him, which um, uh, he just gives a flavor of the political geography he proceeds. It's partly because Nick's a, probably one of the leading scholars of nationalism in Central Asia. That's his book from three years ago. Uh, but he's also a Christian scholar who, who's wrote and written a number of Christian books. Uh, most recently, uh, Warlike Christians in an Age of Violence, which is um, it's a fantastic um, book and has an image there from the, the North Caucasus on the on the front cover. OK, so there's some that tells you something about how politics changed in form in Central Asia. But how has it changed in content? So. Fourthly, we have deepening authoritarianism. So uh, I said there was political conflict around 1991 and there was. Much of it was beneath the surface. And actually, in three of the five republics, that's Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan, you had the same leader who had been the head of the republic in the Soviet Union, who had backed the August 1991 KGB coup against Mikhail Gorbachev, but then continued in to be the president of the independent republic. So that's Saporomat Niazov in Turkmenistan, who was president until his death in 2006. Islam Karimov in, in Uzbekistan, who was president until, until his death in 2016. And the Sultan Nazarbayev, who's still alive and is still in the formal position of what's called leader of the nation, but had stepped down in 2019 as being president. And what all of these people did, and not just them, but also Tajikistan, certainly, not so much Kyrgyzstan, is create what we call single pyramids of rule. That is, they made sure all politics flows through them at the top. And there were really there really wasn't any reasonable challenge. No alternative um, group of politicians that could step in and rule the country. So while some of them had multi-party elections, they were fake zombie elections in effect, certainly after the early 1990s, because the parties that were there didn't really have a constellation of political and economic power which could challenge the regime. Um, and so what they've done, therefore, is over time push their oppositions out of the country completely, 
or captured them and jailed them. But the ones that escaped, went overseas, went in the exile movements again that I um, that I talked about briefly before. I showed the example of the Kazakh, Muqtal Blyazov, who was one of those. Um, and then they've been subject to what we call this transnational repression. Again, that's what we monitor. So politics, in a sense, political competition, more of it takes place outside of Central Asia now than in Central Asia, because the, the, the enemies, those that regimes are afraid of, aren't in the country anymore. They, they are overseas. Um, and so the graph here is, is pretty clear on that, I think, that um, Central Asian states, in terms of the democratic institutions, are well below the global mean, strongly. These are highly, some of the most highly authoritarian countries in the world, with the one exception of Kyrgyzstan, which I think it's disputed right now as to what extent it's um, it's staying above that global mean, I think. It certainly has regressed in, in the last two or three years, coming up to um, the, the most recent uprising against the government just two weeks ago. But Kyrgyzstan is something an exception. And, and, and the reason for it being an exception, I think, really come to the next slide and the fifth point. And that is about the form of market economy that's emerged. And it's one which is of rent-seeking capitalism. So some people claim that there hasn't really been economic transition to market economies in Central Asia. That's simply not true. They have gone through quite a number of the steps of financial and economic liberalization. What is true is that it's in most places completely impossible to open and run a successful business without having deep political ties to the regime in power. And so what we've had is partial marketization and liberalization but not the emergence of a rule of law based market economy. So what we get, therefore, is an economy that runs around family dynasties and close circles of their clients, if you like, but deep connections between elites and they run the whole economy. There's often a link into organized crime with that, too, uh, because running an economy like that is a cabal. Um, a bit like running the mafia, I suppose. And so in a place, a region which sees a lot of uh, drugs running through it from Afghanistan towards Europe, this would be particularly true of Tajikistan, you have organized crime connected into these economies too. Uh, we've seen already the vital importance of offshore accounts. I could give you examples of that from all of the Central Asian republics. In Turkmenistan, they have what is basically an offshore slush fund that about 15 years ago had $40 billion in it, which was well in excess of the GDP of the country at the time, I think. Um, and they were basically just using that as a kind of offshore treasury to pay for stuff, but also, of course, to enrich the elites. So I think the way we explain this in terms of how it's happened and the variation is, is back to these, these pyramids of power. And this is where we get at the fact that to some extent in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan, it has been possible to have a, an alternative coalition challenging um, the ruling elite because in the 1990s, it was possible to go into business without the state dispossessing you and demanding that business be theirs. Um, in Kazakhstan, that's really not true anymore. Uh, but in Kyrgyzstan, it, it's still almost true, I think certainly was when I was living there a few years ago. Whereas in those countries that are marked there with their tighter pyramids of power, um, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, it's really not true at all. If you have a business, uh, then it's going to have to be one that's allied to, to the regime. OK, so the sixth and final one of all these, I'm going to close you soon. I was told about 45 minutes. And I think I've been going about 40 or so minutes now, um, is subordinate civil societies. Now, the graph there shows political participation. And again, it shows the global mean with all Central Asian states being far below the global mean in terms of their assessed level of political participation, except for Kyrgyzstan, which has this quite turbulent active politics and a fairly active and political civil society. So again, it's the exception. And we could talk a bit about why that is in, in the question and answer. One thing I think to prefigure all of this is that those high levels of labor migration are, are really, really important here. And I think perhaps explain, um, well, I'm not sure what they explain, to be honest, but I, I, I'm going to put that out there because there's a huge variation between what that does for Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. 
but it, it seems in the Tajik case at least to really undermine the possibility of political participation in the country. Um, yes, yeah, so what we have then is civil society which is kind of ethnicized, so you can really only have the right to take a prominent position as a um, participant in society if you're of the majority ethnic group, with a few exceptions of loyal ethnic minorities. And most importantly of all, a civil society which is controlled by the state, uh, which is rather than being non-governmental organisations, which are activist non-governmental organisations, you have what one scholar has called the Dongo, which is the donor organised non-governmental organisation, when donors come in and pay for NGOs, which then really kind of provide a set of services which the state isn't providing. And another type, which is the Gongo, which is the government organized non-governmental organization. And that's really common in Central Asia, where the state sets up these NGOs in order to kind of subcontract services to do it and make it look to the UN and major international actors that we have a kind of independent civil society. Everyone knows in practice that's not how it works, but they kind of play along with the charade because it's convenient to do so. OK, so I'm kind of done with my explanation of all this. But before I end, I thought I would refer somewhat to the religious context in Central Asia. Um, so it's a complicated story. I, I don't want to spend too long over it because I've been going a long time already. But um, what's really, really important to understand, first of all, and I've just been teaching my students on this this last couple of weeks, so it's very much in my head, is that the 1920s and 1930s in the Soviet Union were, were a real strong campaign against religion of all forms, uh, Orthodox Christianity, uh, but particularly Islam in, in Central Asia. Uh, but the way that Islam came back into um, Central Asia in the Soviet period was through its recreation under the Soviet system. So the Soviets set up a spiritual board of Muslims. It set up Muftiats. It built mosques. Um, and it did so, so it could control religion. It's far easier, the Soviets understood this, it's far easier to control things by creating them than by repressing them. Right. If you create them, you set the terms under which they operate. And that's what the Soviet Union did. And it, what it did is made Islam in the Soviet era a tradition, uh, an aspect of national culture. So Kyrgyz and Tajiks and Turkmens were Muslims. But if you're a minority in that country, of course, uh, from a European background, like a Russian or an ethnic German, of course, you weren't a Muslim. So religion was very strongly attached to uh, ethnic identity. And it was a cultural attribute that was obviously secondary to, to any kind of politics, uh, the politics of socialism. Um, now, what that began to change in the 80s with the Islamic revival. But, but again, here, I think we can potentially misunderstand a little bit about what occurred. Most Central Asians have not adopted particularly conservative or militant forms of Islam. I think that's changing a little bit over the last 10 years, partly because of this lack of hope in politics and the economy, these dislocated societies that I've been talking about. People have gone more to Islam. Yeah. Um, that's also been fueled a little bit, I think, or our understandings of it have been fueled by the fears of radicalization that have emerged not just in the west since the late 90s and, and 2001 but also in the former soviet union itself where we see central asian muslims and a, a, a number of very small splinter islamist groups which are overseas they're based overseas actually either afghanistan or to some extent in in the isis territories in in the middle east um, we see them as representative of a risk of radicalization in the country. They, they are obviously horrendous militant groups, but they're a tiny fraction, really. Um, and there's not a widespread problem of radicalization in Central Asia. And again, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, so, um, yes, I could also talk about Protestant mission, but I will leave that out um, for potentially for discussion later in the Q&A. And, and, and the... Um, the, the picture there is really just to kind of illustrate a point that I'd just like to take you away from this brief tangent, like you to take away, is that religion sometimes gets used by politics or gets uh, cannibalized by politics or social change. And, and we see that in Central Asia. So this is um, a couple of weeks ago, um, 
Friday, a group of people who really late in the day were violent protesters and rioters against, um, well, for one candidate and against another in the political struggle in Kyrgyzstan, undertaking Namaz Friday prayers in, in the city square. Uh, but they weren't there, obviously, for religion. They were there for politics. And um, it, sometimes that is the way that religion gets utilised by, by political elites. Um, and we see some evidence from that in Central Asia that we could talk about a bit later. So I will just conclude now very briefly, as I'm over my time by now. Um, so Central Asians might appear politically passive, I think the exception of Kyrgyzstan is really important because it, it suggests that these culture based explanations that these people just don't involve themselves in politics um, or that the argument that there's just not enough demand for kind of democracy or liberal politics is is not right, actually, because in Central Asia, you, in, in Kyrgyzstan, you have a great deal of demand for that. And it's manifest. It, it's not fully successful at all, but it's a very different environment to the rest of Central Asia. So for me, the issue here is much more about supply of politics. The kind of order we have in Central Asia brings structural violence, domination. Uh, it brings a suffocating level of stateness. It brings forms of nationalism, which are exclusive. It brings a deepening authoritarian political system. Market economies, which are kind of gated because they're dominated by these factions. And the subordination of civil society so that it simply does the bidding of the elite. But what I tried to show, and it, it's a bit in the blue text in particular through the slides, is that these aren't purely domestic matters. They're international too. We're partly responsible for them in some respects, and other international actors and aspects are, are responsible for them in, in other respects. Um, so this isn't a purely Central Asian story. It, it's a global story. Um, so I think in that sense, the way we approach things at Exeter, at least in our group, and I approach the study of Central Asia, is that if we're implicated in all this, we also need to try and help be part of the solution to this. Because for Central Asians to start becoming re-enchanted or re have a renewed interest, a level of participation in politics, they need support from the outside. They need their countries to be in a global economy and global politics, which actually enables properly accountable and transparent government to emerge. And at the moment, that's not really the kind of global politics and economy that we have. So I will finish at that. I apologize for going slightly over time. And I welcome your questions. Well, thank you, John. And um, for those of you who have questions, uh, go ahead and uh, put that in the chat box and then I'll collect those and ask John start off with a couple of questions first is you know when you when you talk about these states being um rent, having rent seeking capitalism um it seems to reading through that that seem to be both local and international so in a sense um you have clicks who are all powerful so to get in the game you got to pay off so people from the local thing if they want to do business or anything else they got to pay off powerful leads to get permissions um, I guess the other thing would be playing off international players uh, uh, for uh, power politics. So uh, play China off against the United States, Russia uh, for the One Belt Road project, uh, that kind of thing. And then and then there are kickbacks through all that. Is that is it both and 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 also drugs and everything else? <laughs> yeah, I can answer that one right right away if you like. So. Um... Yes, it is both and. Um, and I think the two things are, are quite connected. So because the sovereign elite around the president are those that can say yes or no to major foreign investment, it's also much easier for them to maintain their dominance in their local economic environments, because you can't do a kind of independent deal where a foreign business comes in to do to do business with a set of independent business people who are not part of the regime. So okay. they're both deeply, deeply connected. And this is, you know, we it sounds so obvious, I think, to me at least, when I say it like that. And I don't feel like I'm making a point here which is particularly profound at all. But unfortunately, as social scientists, we live in academic fields which often bracket off the domestic and the international as separate things. Mm. And so the extent to which they're 
intermingled is 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 often overlooked. But you know, Central Asia is a great case of that because these republics became independent along with the other Soviet republics in this last wave of decolonization. I'm calling it uh, 1991, which is an era of globalization. It is an era of deregulated capital. Um, it is after uh, the decline of the what's called the Bretton Woods system and the system of capital controls that are in place really until about the early 1970s. Yeah. So that's why I think we have these this intermeshing of, of domestic and international and this very low levels of regulation, which allow what I'm calling rent seeking capitalism to, to, to happen. OK, John, here's another question. Um, this says uh, my question would be about the degree to which the authority structures and participatory uh, 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 leading of society are mirrored in the churches and Christian social movements of Central Asia, especially as, as these were in the 1990s heavily influenced by American and Western Western European ways of doing church. A parallel question would be apply to Central Asian Muslim communities influenced by Wahhabism in the last decade. The question is really about religious internal politics not politics or how do uh, how do they reflect <laughs> yes um okay well that's a really interesting question um i think in the sense that authority is a very strong social value in central asia it's not it's not just about these global connections you know there is a longer lineage of of, of authority in that sense as a cultural and social value you do see some of that in the church. I've witnessed that firsthand. It's not all foreign, though, actually. Uh, some, or, or, sorry, it's not all local. Um, I've seen some of it articulated by highly conservative Protestant missionaries from the US and from Korea who seem to think that church government should be about a very dominant pastor telling everyone else what to do, which myself being um, from a, um, a nonconformist background uh, in, in Britain, is, is uh, I found myself somewhat in disagreement with them in their views of church government. So you see elements of that, both from the internationals and some of the local pastors that have been trained up. And I think that's what Mark is hinting at is when he says, you know, heavily influenced by American and Western ways of doing church. Um, yeah, so I think, but on the whole, my sense is, is the Christian, the Protestant, the new Protestant church, you know, you, you had Russian Baptist in Central Asia before, but the new Protestant church um, brought by mission since largely since 1991 is a subculture and it and it is quite distinct from wider society. It is, you know, that I've seen more true expressions of a kind of Acts 2 type church in Central Asia than I've seen in Britain in recent years, to be honest. Uh, and part of that is the strength and character of, of foreign mission people that are there. And some of it is is the strength and character, in fact, more of it, to be honest, is the strength and character of the new generation of local leaders. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's the, probably the best way to answer that. And the second part of the question on Central Asian Muslim communities, I mean, so Central Asian Islam, in terms of the legal schools of Islam, would, would, would trace itself to Hanafi Islam. It's also heavily Sufi influence. So Wahhabism would be really very, uh, very different uh, and very alien to Central Asia. Um, so the communities that have been influenced by Wahhabism have been very, very, very minor and tended to be those that have gone transnational. So people like uh, the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, which was really for the last 20 years hasn't been anywhere near Uzbekistan except for one or two isolated attacks. It's been in Afghanistan, it's been in northern Pakistan and I think some elements of it went to fight in Iraq and Syria in the last five years um, and, and some of the groups some of the Tajik militants may be um, also influenced by Wahhabism supposedly I mean I, I, I tend to take the view that what you have here is what the French scholar of political Islam calls the Islamization of radicalism rather than the radicalization of Islam and what he means by that is that you've got a bunch of people, usually young men in their 20s and 30s, who want to fight, who might have an organized crime background, who are in gangs already. They're searching for meaning in their lives. Mm. And this is what they find it through. And that is Islam. And if you actually 
when you look at their biographies, many of them have no real background in faith prior to suddenly becoming a Wahhabi. Um, now, there's quite a bit of research on this now, and that's a common path for many who become Islamic militants. They, you know, they maybe come from fairly secular backgrounds and then suddenly have this point of conversion. So I find that probably the most um, convincing explanation for the for the attraction to Wahhabism by very, very small numbers of Central Asian Muslims, largely Central Asians who've left the five former Soviet republics. Thank you, John. Um, uh, here's another question. How can we hold politicians accountable for the financial and political rope they give to the elites in these countries who are usually extractive in their relationships with their own people? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, you know, the, the danger of all this, I think, is that we continue to see this all through that very simple black box of the state, I would call it. But what I mean is those people over there threatening us over here. So there's a, in Britain, at least, there's a part of the public discussion on this is that, oh, my, our financial systems are being corrupted by this Russian money, this Gulf money, this Central Asian money. Um, and how do we protect ourselves against it? Now, there might be a few bad apples, a few dodgy lawyers and financial service providers in London, but the main problem is probably in offshore places like BVI and Panama. And, you know, mostly our big institutions are kind of fine. Now, that's certainly not what uh, Jyoti, who, who asked the question, is suggesting, of course, but that's part of the public discussion of this in, in Britain, certainly. Um, it's rubbish. Uh, we're deeply bound up with them. Um, our financial service providers, particularly in London, are astonishingly good at providing space and room for dark money and denying that that's what they're doing. And it's really quite interesting. I, I'm going to focus on Britain here because it, it, the story is a bit different depending on what you're talking about. But London is obviously one of the premier global financial centres and it, it's, it's top of the list for some things like uh, extraterritorial legal services, which are important here. And political risk analysis, which is the people that do the due diligence work. So a lot of that's coming through London. It really is the, the, the global centre for that. Um, so for me, what's been interesting last five or six years is you've seen the British government say, look, we know this is a problem. And so we're going to regulate more. And so they've come up with a few things. They've said, OK, well, how, we'll make sure that the beneficial owners of companies are stated in company's house, the, the, the company's registry in Britain. We will make sure if we've got uh, property purchases in Britain, which is probably been done through corrupt money, we will investigate that through the National Crime Agency. So they've brought in something called unexplained wealth orders. And there's a number of things like this that have emerged, uh, not just in Britain, other countries too. In Britain, the special way that we do it is we make a lot of pious statements about it and we write a law which looks good on paper. And then we don't give the agencies that enforce it enough power and money to do so. So the National Crime Agency has far less resource to prosecute these things than many of the oligarchs who are employing big British or international law firms like Mishkondorea to defend them. And so you have cases like this year, it's one that we've been looking into on my research project of uh, the, the daughter of President Nazarbayev in Kazakhstan, Dariga Nazarbayeva who for many years was thought of being the next president, being able to defend herself in the court of law with her very highly paid lawyers, that is Mishkondorea, saying, look, you haven't really proved that this money was corrupt. And look, here's the accounts from Kazakhstan. She has hundreds of millions of dollars. These are all her legitimate business interests. Um, and so you, what you have then is the National Crime Agency not really building an effective case not really, pro therefore, the country not really being able to improperly enforce this. And in that case, you had an English judge stand up and say, yeah, but she's on the Forbes list in Kazakhstan as one of the wealthiest people. So clearly, clearly she can afford this. So what they've done is they've seen that there's money in the bank account, but haven't gone to the next step to say that, is it merely a coincidence that she happens to be the daughter of the president? And they haven't really tackled the core question about sources of wealth which is the fact that Kazakhstan is a kleptocracy. It is ruled by a few hundred people 
who own the vast majority of the country because of their position in political power. Now, that is illegal, certainly in terms of the anti-corruption rules that we have, but it's not being properly enforced. And so what you have is, in Britain at least, the government turned around and said, we've done this, we've done this, we've done this, we're making progress, but actually they're not properly enforcing the laws they have. And that is the core the core issue here. And, and the one thing we really need to do to give the really, really short answer to Jotty's question is some bankers and lawyers need to be going to prison. And once you have, and they don't at the moment, we have a Proceeds of Crime Act and we don't use it. You know, that's been on the books for 18 years in Britain. And you've had free convictions of professional service providers and they've been fined in the worst case they were that person was fined far less money than they made in um made they made as uh, as tribute on the sale so you know, these are serious crimes serious white collar crimes that mean that large parts of the world are dominated by corrupt governments and yet we just in very even in in the cases which are properly prosecuted you just get a slap on the wrist so it's really about enforcement and it's about i think therefore more more political pressure from the public once they become aware of this uh, but it's a complex complex issue so people like me are struggling to try and get uh, a more realistic understanding of this in the public debate but um we're often fighting against big interests that don't want that to to come forward you know the knowledge on this to come through i've said spent a long time answering that question because it's it's a really interesting and important one sorry one of the things they, they, they try to do in the states uh, more with um the mafia or or, or high level crime but they move into corporate is, is called the rico statutes which is a racketeering corrupt organizations act so they can just seize the money mm. and then <laughs> that usually gets people's attention <laughs> really fast um, <laughs> What I said actually about the law and enforcement, it's the opposite situation in the US. Some US laws are really not very good, but the enforcement is fantastic. I mean, occasionally they'll step in and just, you know, HSBC got fined. It was in the billions in the US for the racketeering of the Mexican drug money. Yeah. Uh, we have none of that, none of that in Britain. So, uh, yeah. A question in that, in terms of the economies, are these economies growing or shrinking or are they part of Collins's bottom billion do they suffer from things like Collins calls the the Dutch disease where you have a tremendous uh, national mineral or, or other resources that are controlled by a small oligarchy that are then kind of taken out of the country and have all kinds of horrible effects on the countryside but the money's not distributed. Is, is that the situation there? Or yeah, what is going on in terms of all this? Yeah, I think, so you're talking about Paul Collier, who's a political yeah, economist. Collier, yeah, right, right, right. yeah um, who's written this book called The Bottom Billion. And, and before that, uh, he did a lot of work on the political economy of armed conflict, which was what, which was about how um, he, he really presented armed conflict as being about greed. So, you know, when factions were fighting in civil wars, they were often doing so to capture control of big businesses, extractive industries, that kind of thing, rather than to fight any kind of ideological or broader political agenda. So I think there's a lot to be said for that. Uh, Collier is an economist and he has an economic economics view, which um, I'm a political economist. Mm -hmm. And so my view is a little, I would say, broader. Um, so I think the problem with Collier is I mean, I think he's right on large part, but um, he really is very much focused on the domestic conditions which enable this. Okay. And I don't think as a fully, fully kind of, how to say, um, he, as a market economist, he doesn't fully explain really how the market has created many of the opportunities. Yeah. I think, you know, he, he tends to see the external environment as benign, whereas the political economy point, certainly in the school of political economy I work with is that it is precisely the market and deregulation which has created these conditions globally which allow this to happen. Um, and you can't simply um, achieve domestic rule of law and resolve that problem. You know, the, the, the corrosion of domestic rule of law is partly about the global market economy. 
and so that there's a sort of nuanced difference there but on the whole Collier's work is obviously world leading and um and important and that book on the bottom billion is is very good at, i think at highlighting uh the precarity of you know and certainly some central asian peoples they they, they are in, in what he would call the bottom billion yes yeah um i don't see any other quite but i've got a million questions <laughs> uh, one of the things is in terms of your work john you touched on it a couple times is this whole thing in terms of the rise of civil society and and as part of what you're suggesting is these things uh a, a strong uh, uh, independent sector of civil society just cannot develop right now because of the global economy. So, so those things are always sort of hammered down. And then I guess on the other side, do you see any hope? Do you see any anomalies within this kind of kleptocracy where you see the beginnings of some kind of bodies that are allowed to rise both in terms of whether it's intellectual, religious markets, otherwise that allow some kind of, of development of a kind of a, a middle ground of, of, of neither the government nor just individuals. Yeah, um, I, think, I think there is hope. I think there's hope transnationally and there's hope domestically. Um, I don't think Kanat from Kyrgyzstan's on this call and I think, um, He's, he's been ill lately, unfortunately. But mm -hmm. in Kyrgyzstan, it's been a pretty remarkable day, just to give you a domestic story. I mean, I did say um, Kyrgyzstan something of an exception. And, you know, those of us who follow Kyrgyzstan closely, I, I lived in Kyrgyzstan for three, three and a half years, taught, taught at a university there, uh, and have done a reasonable amount of research on the country, less than I've done on Tajikistan, but still a, a reasonable amount. And... Um, We've been very worried over the last week or 10 days because it seemed that the new guy that's come in and pushed out the president, uh, a guy called Japadov, um, was very tied to organized crime. Yeah. And so there's there's a kind of criminal kingpin in Kyrgyzstan called uh, Reimbak Matreimov. And um, it seemed like basically you had you were going to have capture of the government by organized crime, which is something we got close to in Kyrgyzstan about 10, 12 years ago. Um, but then that led to another rebellion and that lot were kicked out. So, you know, I, I'm i very, a little hesitant about this, but the kind of politics you have in Kyrgyzstan, where there is popular rebellion against high levels of corruption, even though it, it does create conditions for, thankfully, relatively minor outbreaks of violence, but nevertheless outbreaks of violence, is some form of accountability in, in a country which is emerging and it's not going to do so according to some strict interpretation of the constitution and the rule of law. It's going to be turbulent because that's what we know about the emergence of democracies. They always emerge in fractious ways with powerful working class movements or nationalist rebel movements, let's say, fighting for rights. Um, that's almost always the case anyway. It's certainly the case across Europe and um, I think much of the world. And so you kind of expect to see that sort of turbulence. And the, the sort of silver lining behind what's gone on in Kyrgyzstan over the last week or two, which has been violent, which seemed to be leading towards the strengthening of organized crime, not its weakening, is that today they've launched, literally just a few hours ago, the new president has launched a, a criminal case against Matarimov. Um, so, you know, there is, even amongst relatively corrupt political elites, they have to be somewhat responsive to civil society mobilizations of this kind because they know they can they can push them out. And I, I don't want to oversimplify it because, yeah. you know, the kind of rebellions we've seen in Kyrgyzstan, they haven't principally been driven by anti-corruption. It's part of it, but not all. But um, nevertheless, I think that's uh, important you know, the, the, the shining light in Central Asia is Kyrgyzstan. It's looked down upon by other countries and regions because of its instability, but it is the one place where you actually have some form of accountability for the elite. And then the transnational point is that, you know, the kind of stuff where I see where effective, whether it's effective academic discourse that's in political science, that's really speaking to core political issues, effective activism, effective journalism, it's all transnational. Mm. It's all Central Asians working with those people like me who are fortunate enough to be in privileged positions in liberal democracies. 
Um, and however badly run those liberal democracies like ours are, they're still liberal democracies and they generate a little bit more freedom. And so by working together transnationally, journalists from, say, Kyrgyzstan can get some of these stories for corruptions out into the global space. Mm. So that's what happened when the Matarimov case, uh, the a Kyrgyz news agency called Kloop, worked with something called the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, which is the, probably the leading group of investigative journalists working on these kinds of stories of how money gets laundered across borders. And he put it out into the, into, into the public sphere. And that's one of the things that then fed back in to Kyrgyzstan and created the conditions for this um, rebellion against the fraudulent elections of a couple of years ago. So I think there are there's bright there's, pos, there's there's some cause for optimism locally, but part of that is also transnational. Okay, we've got one more on um, journalism. It says, um, "What's your view on the relationship between politics and the mass media in the in the region?" The uh, governments in Central Asian countries control the uh, mass media and use it as a tool of political propaganda. In Kazakhstan, for example, President uh, Nazarbayev's immediate family and associates directly control most media outlets as well as the bulk of the economy. Unless the newspapers and TV stations become independent financially, uh, they cannot be uh, independent politically. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely right. Uh, I mentioned briefly Mukhtar Eblazov, um, who's this Kazakh renegade oligarch. He, he's by no means some kind of pure figure, by the way. He stole lots of money. Anyone who comes out of the elite um, of Kazakhstan or any of the Central Asian countries really is going to have stolen quite a lot at some point. But, um, you know, I mean, he one of the things he did was was, was try and set up media answerable to him rather than answerable to President Nazarbayev. And that was one of the main things that, that got him into trouble. And you, you see you've seen those stories elsewhere in Central Asia where any kind of independent media has been shut down in Tajikistan. You know, when I was first there doing field work in 2003, four, um, it was you still did have independent media that would report on difficult stories for the government by uh, about 2010 12 that really had ceased to exist uh, you you do have one news agency but it, it just has so limited reach within the society so sometimes these independent media end up becoming largely external so that they're, they're uh, maybe they're accessible outside the country through websites uh, but they're not they're blocked inside the country um, and you know the printed press in the country or the tv stations and radio are, are almost entirely controlled by the regime and that that is undoubtedly uh, the 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 case, and I think it's hard to know what you do about that. Really, I mean, it's transnational media through radio can have some reach, things like the BBC World Service, but that's been chronically underfunded recently. Perhaps more importantly, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, and in Tajikistan, for example, there's been an enormous struggle to try and keep that service independent of the Tajik government because they do broadcast in Tajik in the country. And obviously that is a major <laughs> cause of concern um, to, to, the Tajik, to, to the Tajik government. But I think I mentioned earlier that, you know, we think of authoritarian conflict management, but I think you can say this about authoritarian government, governance as well, as being about controlling the economy, space, and by that we mean also public space and obviously the territory of the country as well, but also discourse. Yeah. So, you know, this public discourse is absolutely vital to to control the framework within which people think about about political life and that, that that's why they do it that's why control of the media is so so important well thank you john it's just been an excellent excellent webinar and i think with that we will start to bring it to a close just to let everyone know next week we have a fascinating speaker from boston college barak tula um tulo um asheroff uh, who's going to look at Christianity in Central Asia. So, so that should be um, a, a, an excellent lecture as well. But this has been uh, very, very good and, and a really a nice understanding of the framework and, and, and an area that we don't know that well. So thank you, John, and we really appreciate this. And we will get this up on our on – the thank yous are coming in on the notes. So, so thank you so much, John, and appreciate the thing. Well, with that, I will say goodbye. And have a lovely afternoon. Again, cheers. Thank you. Yeah, pleasure. It was, uh, it was enjoyable. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.